Okay, then we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so um, to start out, um, based off the title of mine, you can see that um, my session is gonna be titled ELL Support and STEM. Um, but before I go into doing too much um, kind of talking and getting to the STEM portion, I wanna start out with a quick little warm up activity um, to kind of introduce kind of what my session really is about. Um, I know it's ELLs obviously, but um, there's a little bit more to it. So what I'm gonna do, I need you guys to do me a favor and grab a piece of paper from the middle of um, your table. So grab a piece of paper. There should be um, a paper at everyone's table, but if not, you don't that. Okay, so everyone should have a piece of paper. And what we're gonna do to start out is I'm gonna have you guys make an origami for me. Okay, so you're gonna make an origami and it's supposed to be a dub when you're done, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to play the directions on this audio and it's gonna tell you exactly what to do step by step. Okay, so I want you to pay careful attention and I want you to follow along with that audio. Hola, ¿qué tal estáis? En el vídeo de hoy os vamos a enseñar a hacer una paloma de la paz de papel como esta que veis aquí. Vamos a empezar. Lo que necesitamos para hacer nuestra paloma de la paz es un papel cuadrado como este que veis aquí. Este es de 21 centímetros por 21 centímetros. Lo he sacado de un folio de 4 que era rectangular cortándole esta parte que veis aquí. Lo que tenemos que hacer ahora es poner nuestro papel cuadrado en esta posición y doblarlo a la mitad marcando una línea aquí. Ahora cogemos esta esquina y la vamos a doblar hacia abajo. Okay. Now, some of you all are sitting there and you're like, okay, you really don't have the opportunity to engage right now. Like literally, at all. you don't have the opportunity to participate. You're either just faking it till you make it, or you're just sitting there like, I'm not even gonna try it. Like you know, I cannot do this. But we're gonna give it one more shot. So if you've already tried something, let's start over. So get a new piece of paper. Some of y'all literally didn't even try anything. Um, so you can just keep the same paper. But um, we're gonna try this one more time. We're gonna try it a little differently this time. Any minute. Any minute now. There we go. Okay, so let's try it one more time. Hola, ¿qué tal estáis? En el vídeo de hoy os vamos a enseñar a hacer una paloma de la paz de papel como esta que veis aquí. Vamos a empezar. Lo que necesitamos para hacer nuestra paloma de la paz es un papel cuadrado como este que veis aquí. Este es de 21 centímetros por 21 centímetros. Lo he sacado de un folio de 4 que era rectangular, cortándole esta parte que veis aquí. Lo que tenemos que hacer ahora es poner nuestro papel cuadrado en esta posición y doblarlo a la mitad, marcando una línea aquí. Ahora, Cogemos esta esquina y la vamos a doblar hacia abajo. Le damos la vuelta al papel y con esta otra esquina hacemos lo mismo. Y esta que acabamos de doblar la doblamos ahora hacia arriba. Lo que tenemos que hacer ahora con esta figura que nos ha quedado es doblarla a la mitad. Así. La colocamos en esta posición y vamos a doblar el papel desde esta esquina de aquí, trazando una línea por aquí. Así.
Ya casi tenemos lista nuestra paloma de la paz. Le damos la vuelta a esto así. Como podéis ver, esta sería la cabeza de la paloma, la cola, un ala y el otro ala. Ahora vamos a doblarle para hacerle el pico esta parte hacia abajo. Así. Ya la tenemos lista. Si queremos también podemos doblar esta esquina de aquí abajo hacia arriba para hacerle una cola. Y ahora sí, ya tendríamos lista nuestra paloma de papel. Okay. So, from that point, looking at you guys, every single one of y'all were engaged that time. Now, I don't know how your dad turned out. It might not be the prettiest dad in the world or whatever, but you all participated and you all were able to get a final product, right? Way better than it was the first time. Why do you think that was? Why do you think everybody was able to be engaged this time? Okay, one, you had like a visual to follow along with this time, right? It was still in Spanish. It was still the exact same task as it was when I played the audio. That's the big thing, right? Like whenever I played the audio, I still expected the same product out of you as when I did this. So the main idea that I'm here to talk about today in my session is that ELL learners, they have a language barrier, not an ability barrier. We should not take that as like, we need to give them a different type of task because they can't do it. That's not what needs to happen at all. In fact, it should have the exact same expectations across the board for all ELL students. They sometimes just need language support. That's what my focus is on today. My focus is not to make easier tasks or do different things with them, but how can we support them in our instruction? And I'm going to kind of show you some of the STEM concepts that I have done with them. The STEM seems really overwhelming to kind of incorporate with these group of kiddos sometimes. And so I'm going to kind of show you some tips and tricks that I have learned along the way um, just from working with my ELO kiddos and the resources that I was given um, through the Endeavor and the NASA program. So um, what we're going to do, if you'll go back to that pair deck for me, we're going to start But I want to kind of gauge the room and kind of see where you guys fall on the spectrum of ELLs. So I want to know, like, have you ne if you've never had an ELL kid in your life, in your classroom, or like I'm the uh, ELL person at our school. So one of those things. So tell me where you fall on that um, spectrum. Okay, good. Okay, so we've got pretty much kind of the same idea here as a class or a group, I guess you would say. Um, but pretty much no one in here has never had any experience with ELL. Um, but we're not all like experts. All of our kiddos are ELLs. Um, so that kind of gives me a good idea on where to um, kind of level our um, discussions here today. Um, so the first thing that I want to kind of do is describe myself and kind of describe why I have picked um, this topic. So um, first, my name is Jalen Puckett. I've taught math for four years at Webster County High School. Um, one of the first things that really got me kind of interested in this idea of ELL um, before the STEM um, program was um, I have three adopted sisters. Um, one of them was adopted, well, two of them were adopted um, from China, and the other one was adopted through foster care. Um, the one that I'm holding, um, she was brought to the United States at three years old, and she was an ELL learner. She didn't know any English or anything. Um, so I kind of got my handful at that even before I started teaching, um, whenever she came to the United States. And that whole idea of like seeing her grow, seeing what she was able to do, just kind of really interested me. And then whenever I went to Webster County, I was shocked um, whenever I saw how large of a Hispanic, po a Hispanic population we had, um, which really gave me an opportunity to get some experience with our ELL learners that um, we have at that school. And even though I am not bilingual, I want to kind of note that. So this is coming from somebody that cannot speak Spanish. I cannot speak any other language um, that some ELL learners um, might need. I can't do that. 
So I'm here to kind of talk to you guys from the point of view of somebody that's not bilingual. Like, what can we do to communicate and to support them when we don't even speak the language ourselves? And so I've chosen to teach math to the ELL population for our school, and I absolutely love it. Like, every year I have asked for um, this group of kiddos as I've taught math, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. And so what I'm wanting to do now is we're going to start out before we jump into the STEM portion of like how can we, we incorporate these STEM ideas um, and whatnot is I want to kind of show you guys some basic tips and tricks to kind of help our ELL kiddos um, just to be able to like translate like whenever I turn the subtitles on I showed you the videos just those basic um, kind of support that those kiddos need and I'm not going to go in full like spend an entire time demonstrating each of these because I have provided step-by-step -step instructions on how to do each of these. So I'll kind of talk vaguely about them, give you a little bit of time in a second to kind of explore them. But if you need to go back to something later on, I have made step-by-step -step instruction, instructions on the next few slides. Like if you go to the next few, you'll see it says like how to use the Google Translate add-on. And I've tried to make it a very simple to the, to the point um, directions on how to use each of these things, okay? So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to kind of talk just in general about what all of these are. And there's only going to be a couple that I'm really kind of show you how to do. But the first thing that I want to talk about is the Google Translate add-on. And it's a little extension that you can add on and students can add it on um, to their Chromebook. It allows you to translate any web page or even just specific text. Like let's say there's just a word that you need to translate. You can highlight over it and it will instantly pop up a little icon that you can click and it'll translate it for you just like that. It's really neat and um, really quick and efficient. It also provides the opportunity to read the text for you. So let's say that you click on it, you can click that little icon and there's a little speaker button that pops up and you can click on it and it will read the text. It'll read it in English or it'll read it in whatever language um, you're translating it to. Okay. Okay, the next part that I want to talk about and I am actually going to demonstrate um, this part um, is how you can use Google Docs to really support um, your kiddos. So if you click on, um, well, not, not click on, I'll click on it. But if you click on this portion where it says translating example, Google Docs is going to be like your best friend. If you're not familiar with Google Docs already on Google Drive, like it's free, you, anybody can use it. But it's a super, super cool, has some super cool little resources that you can do. So the first thing I'm going to show you is voice typing. And so this is really neat. If let's say you're needing to kind of make some notes or express something to your students and kind of give it to them, but you can't speak their language. Or let's say they're wanting to communicate something or write something to you and they can't speak your language. Well, if you go to tools up at the top, and I'll give you guys some time to kind of play around with this stuff later. And then if you click voice typing, a little microphone will pop up. And then what you can do, you can click that microphone and it is literally going to start typing for you everything that you're saying. So I will start typing and you will see everything that I'm saying show up as I am speaking. You can click the little red um, button and it will stop. And then what's really neat is that you can instantly go up to tools again and you can go down to translate document and you can choose out of all of these languages what you need to translate that to. So we're going to translate it to Norwegian. Now I did Portuguese last time. We're going to do Norwegian um, this time. And it took everything that I just said and it um, turned it into that particular language. And you can do it just like that. Anything that you can make a Google Doc will translate it for you automatically. And there's also that voice typing feature as well if you would rather um, be speaking and do it, okay? So I am gonna let you guys play around with that later, but I do wanna quickly talk about the other ones as well. Okay, now I said Google Docs is your best friend. Um, PDFs, not so much. So PDFs are a little bit harder to translate. Um, so the best thing for you is to convert it to a Google Doc and then translate it. And sometimes that gets a little messy, um, but the best converter that I have found is up here that I've provided for you. There's not really much step-by-step -step instructions on it because you click it and it's pretty self-explanatory. It says like upload something here and it converts it automatically. So it's um, it's a little bit um, nice of a tool, but it's kind of there because PDF files are kind of a pain in the butt to, 
um, Translate. So that's there for you guys. This one is a really cool one. Um, Google Meet Translated Captions. And like I said, they're step by steps on all of these things I'm talking about. You're going to get to go in and see them specifically. But Google Meet Translated Captions, I accidentally um, stumbled upon um, because I accidentally clicked a button whenever I was in Google Meet with my kiddos this year. And it started doing the captions for me as I was talking, like live. And I went in and looked, and there's an option to have that translated as well. So as I was talking on the Google Meet, it was automatically taking what I was saying and writing it out in Spanish. And so that's kind of an accident that I stumbled upon that, but it's been super useful. And for my kids that are in person, like this doesn't have to be remote. Let's say that you've got a kid that would benefit from that. You can have them if you're one to one. That's the only hard part. If your kids don't have Chromebooks, this is a little bit kind of, you can't really do this. But um, if they do have access to Chromebooks in any way, you can sit the Chromebook by them and you can remote into your class. And as you're talking throughout the lesson, what you're saying can be popping up and they can be following along that way. And it's just, it's live. You don't even have to necessarily worry about having it typed out ahead of time or anything like that. It'll just do it as you're, as you're talking. Um, so it's, it's a nice little tool um, to have. And also if you're doing like group work, you can have like the kids sitting by each other and you can have like one kid saying thing and it'll translate it kind of to the other. So it's a nice little tool. And then the last one, there is kind of a catch to this one. Um, you have to have the Pear Deck Premium. And I don't know if you all are very familiar with Pear Deck. I started using Pear Deck this year and I love it. Absolutely love Pear Deck. Um, but you do have to have the premium version to get this feature. So if you have a lot of ELL kids, um, you might want to talk to your district or possibly pay up to get the premium because it's got a super cool little um, feature to it. And I did not know about this until like halfway through the year whenever I stumbled upon it as well. Sometimes you just got to kind of mess around and stumble upon stuff. But so what I want you guys to do, you should be on this immersive reader for Pear Deck slide um, on our Pear Deck. And what I want you to do, because I can't show you from the student view because y'all are in the student view. Um, but at the very bottom right of your Pear Deck, you should see a little circle. And that's what immersive reader is, what that is. And if you click on that, you click it, and I can't show you on mine, but there is an option on the right for you to go in and like change the language if you want to. And then what's super cool, what I really like, one, it will translate everything in that language, two, it will read everything in that language, but my favorite part is click on any word on that slide. Click any word on that slide. Did it pop up a picture? Yeah, and it, it won't do it possibly for words like the or a, like some of those um, more simple words that they can't necessarily um, show a picture for exactly. But many words, like longer vocabulary words, you can click on it and it will give you a visual. And that's going to be one of the tips that I show you as far as incorporating STEM is giving a visual, being able to provide as much of a visual instructional lesson for those kiddos um, because it kind of eliminates a little bit of that language barrier. Because like my video, I kept it in Spanish, but you guys were still able to do it. You had that visual to kind of follow. So it just eliminates a little bit of that language barrier. And like I said, that's a super cool little feature, but um, you do have to have the premium version on Pear Deck to have that. So if you do have that, it's you can just have it turned on all the time. It's not even anything you have to necessarily add to the slide. Any Pear Deck will have that on it, okay? Okay, um, so what I'm gonna have you guys do before I move to um, kind of the vocab section, um, take about five minutes to just kind of explore um, those ideas. And once you find like your favorite or something you think you could use, I want you to put it on this section right here. The take five minutes and then write down which tool you found most useful. So I will turn off the, okay, you should be able to go through it on your own now. So like I said, those links don't necessarily work, but they are on that slide. So you can kind of go through and see which ones you want to kind of look at and which would work for your classroom.
Okay. Okay, so like I said, I mean, I don't want to really rush you guys on this, but there are step-by-step -step, um, instructions on anything that you need, and my email's there, too. If you get, have a question about something, get stuck on anything you need um, to ask me, you can ask me. If I don't know, I'll, I'll try to find it out. Um, but what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of move towards that um, STEM portion. So I'm going to kind of stop you guys real quick, and we're going to kind of move to this next part. So before we really get into the STEM portion, I want to talk about just my three, my personal three steps for setting up a successful mindset for ELL learners. Okay, so this is just general. We're not necessarily talking about STEM. We're just talking about the things that I have um, discovered. So um, the first thing is teach independence. And again, being independent, that's a good thing for all students. But the reason why I'm saying this is because it does no good if you are like hogging all these tools for yourself. When you think about it at the beginning of the year, we're supposed to sit there and we're supposed to do icebreakers and set rules, procedures, things like that. From the beginning of the year, you need to be teaching your kids how to do these things themselves. You need to be teaching them how do you translate a document, how do you translate something you don't understand, and have a day where you teach your kiddos how to do that because it's going to make your life easier and they're going to be able to more efficiently participate and jump from task to task and not be left behind because they're trying to figure out how to translate something. And if you have Chromebooks, this makes your life way easier and better for them because they'll automatically be able to translate anything that they need to. And also, the kids take pride in stuff. They don't like having to feel like you've got to give them this separate thing. You've got to give them this translated thing. They're getting something different. They take pride in knowing, no, I don't need her. Like, I can go in and I can do it. I don't need that extra. And it's, it's better on you, too. You know, like, you get to, like, treat them just like everybody else. They don't get that extra little thing because they can do it themselves. So, and like I said, you still want to support them through the process, and there'll be things you got to do, but teaching that independence is huge for them to be able to fully participate. And then the second thing, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the high expectations in a second, but high expectations are um, a huge, huge thing for these kids to be successful. And I know we hear high expectations all the time, like we're told high expectations for all kids constantly. And yes, that, that's true. But there's particularly a reason for these kiddos because, like I said earlier, this is a language barrier. It is not an ability barrier. Keep that in mind. Um, and then the last thing, show you care and the communication will happen. So if, if you let those kids know, I do expect you to do well, I expect this out of you, you're putting that effort in, it doesn't matter if you don't speak the same language, it'll happen, like I promise, I am able to communicate with my kids that I have no idea what they're saying, they have no idea what I'm saying, and yet somehow it's happening, it's working, somehow they're doing stuff in class, so if you show them that they care, they're going to do something. Like they're, they're going to they're going to try. They're going to do something. And so that's that's probably the biggest thing for these um, these kids. So why these three steps? Okay. So now I'm going to get a kind of a little bit into my personal um, situation. I'm not going to go into the STEM part yet um, because this right here is also what has made me think of those three things in particular. Because I think if you have those three things. The rest of it will work itself out. And yes, there's things like be respectful, you know, be prepared. There's all, there's a ton of list of things that I can add into this list, but those three are my main things. And this is why. So this girl right here, I um, subbed for her whenever I was in like seventh grade or when, no, whenever she was in seventh grade, not when I was in seventh grade. Um, but she came from a really, really rough situation. And that's when she got here in um, the United States. She has a very, um, very strong language barrier, um, really struggled in. And um, she told me whenever I was studying for her, she told me she did not have a good experience in school. When she came here, she felt like she was just put on the wayside. She said, I don't feel comfortable talking to anybody. And I just feel like I'm just sat to the side. She said, I want to participate, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared. And people don't really necessarily go out of their way to make me. Um, participate so I, I just I don't feel like I fit in and this year she is a senior so that was like five years ago so um, this year she is a senior and she has a month ago she told me that she has applied to the community college and she is going to be a translator to come back to our school to help so that tells you from seventh grade to senior year what difference you can make and those kids that are really quiet 
And you might, it might be easy to just be like, oh, they're quiet. They don't really want to do anything. They're not really going to push it. And look what could have happened had we just let that happen. So um, that's one example. Um, this kid out right here, um, she graduated last year and she, um, she typically in our class or the way our school is, we like kind of group all of our kids um, together as far as like we try to put um, the ELL learners in one class so we can kind of accommodate them all together. Well, she said, I don't want to do that my senior year. She said, I want to take college algebra. And she was the only one in there. There wasn't going to be an aide. There wasn't going to be anybody to help her. And she did a great job. And she's in, she's at a community college right now and sends me questions still. And she's, she's pursuing a degree in agriculture. And she'll send me questions sometimes. And she's like, I need help with this. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't know how to do this. And she's like, no, I'm good on all of it. I just need the last part. There's just one math part at the end. Like, I understand the rest of it. I'm like, like, she's impressed with me. Like, I'm like, I have no idea what this stuff is. It's blowing my mind. Um, and it's just extremely impressive. And then my last little example, and this is where the high expectations is, like, going through the roof in my, um, in my mind. Okay, this little kid right here. I have grown to absolutely adore this child. I had him, um, I subbed for him when he was an eighth grader, and he was in a collaborative class. And he was, um, this collaborative class, it was, they were very low, uh, low performing um, kiddos. And the teacher that had that class, he was, um, uh, he's not in our district anymore, but he told me, he said, um, you're really gonna struggle with these kids. Like they literally, they can't really do anything. Like they, they can't do anything. And here I am, I'm a sub, I'm, and I just came out of college, and I'm like, I'm just trying to get through the day, you know, I'm like, I, I was like, I didn't know what I was doing either, and, and I was like, this kid was just kind of back, he was real quiet, and, and I just, I had that mindset that that teacher had just said, like, those kids can't do anything, so in my mind, I was like, these kids must be really, really low, well, I got hired on at the school, um, and his freshman year, so that next year, I had him for pre-algebra, and he came in and he kind of has this like little little punk attitude, and he's real, he was real quiet, and he'd sit in the back, and he acted like he didn't really want to do anything, and, but then I started watching, occasionally he would do the work, and I was looking, and I was like, that is really good, like I was impressed for that image that I had been put in my mind about those kids, I had thought like, you know, he's probably, you know, he's probably really going to struggle bad. That was already put in my mind. I was already expecting that. And to see what he did, and then I was like, I'm going to do it. Like, this is wrong. This kid can do this. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. And so I had told him, I was like, you're going to, I expect just as much out of you. You have so much potential, and I'm not going to do this anymore. Like, you're going to do this. And and we kind of had a little come to Jesus me. It was um, a, a pretty big deal for me and for him. And now I had him as a junior and I have him as a senior this year. And he told me as a junior, he said, because he, he really started growing up. He started kind of seeing that potential, seeing what he was able to do. And he told me, he said, Ms. Puckett, you're a whole lot, you're a whole lot nicer this year than you were as a freshman. I was like, oh, you changed a lot too <laughs> as a, from being a freshman. And this year as a senior, and I got get emotional talking about it, but this year as a senior, he was in my ELL Algebra 2 class. Um, and he came up to me and he said, Miss Puckett, I don't want to be in your class anymore. And I was and I was a little offended. I was like, I've had you almost four years and you're you don't want me anymore. Like he said, and he said, he said, No, Miss Puckett, this is not what I need. I want to be in your third period honors algebra two class. He said that, and I was like, I, I was like, okay, 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 we'll make it happen. And he, he's got the highest grade in that class right now. He literally has one of the highest grades. It's earned, it is well-deserved, and he works his butt off, and he does so good. And so I'm not trying to tell you this to necessarily be like, oh, if this is going to happen every time. Every kid's going to be the highest in the class. Like, kids are going to struggle at times, but we have got to expect that they are going to do just as much as everybody else and have that expectation and provide that opportunity for them because had had I not said that and changed and been like okay no this is the mindset me and you are going to have I very easily could have seen that kid just kind of sitting in the corner being the quiet kid that just kind of sits there doesn't really do anything not really being bad but not really being pushed to do anything and so that's a huge thing in my mind. So I'm kind of getting to the STEM part finally. So um, the STEM portion that I want to discuss is kind of 
Um, from an ELL standpoint, so I know we've talked a lot about STEM, and I know that STEM stands for technically science, technology, engineering, math. Like, I know that's what the letters stand for. But to me, throughout this endeavor course, I have like looked at it completely differently. I don't look at it as those content areas anymore. I look at it as a mindset, like a mindset to think, a mindset to like question. And it has nothing to do with the specific content area to me, whatever I've been trying to incorporate. It. It has to do with how can we make connections, get those kids wondering, and have those high expectations for them. So um, with our kiddos um, for ELL, um, I'm going to kind of show three things that have really been my main goal when I've been incorporating these STEM stuff um, with these kiddos. So you're going to see all of these links and resources, and I'm going to give you some time to go through and look at those in a second. Um, but I'm going to show specifically some of the things I've pulled from these things and how they kind of worked out whenever I use them with my kids. So um, this bridge assignment that I did um, a few weeks ago, um, I, I have technically my ELO class this year, half of them are geometry, the other half is algebra two. Um, so I've got two different classes at the same time. Um, I've got like 32 kids and they're all in the ELO program. And so they've been access testing. So usually I can do a small group and like have them pulled with um, our ELL person one day and then switch them up. But since they're access testing, I did not have that support in there. So it was just me. So I was trying to come up with something that I could do for both groups to kind of not get them off track. Like algebra two is on functions and um, geometry was on like geometric um, constructions. And so um, it kind of worked out and I thought, well, I'm going to do this. So I had them come up with the idea of building a bridge. And these resources that I had pulled, I got those from the teaching engineering um, link right here. And again, I'll let you guys go in and pull that, um, pull that up and kind of look through that stuff. But what I want you to see here is that this lesson that I did, I did not get the entire lesson from that engineering um, place. I pulled small things from it. And that is what is the biggest thing for you as an educator when you're trying to do this STEM stuff, not just for ELL kids, but all of them, is that we're starting small. Like, you can't jump into this and be like, I'm going to do everything top to bottom exactly like it said. It's not going to work for any group of kids, probably, if you just do it by the book. So I saw this project. I saw this idea where I could import some, incorporate some geometry and algebra two stuff. And what I did was I showed my kids some examples of some bridges in real life. And I asked them, like, what shapes um, do you notice in this bridge? And they were naming stuff. They were naming um, squares, rectangles, triangles. Um, they were naming everything they saw. Um, and then I asked, well, which one do you think is strongest? Like, do you think it's stronger when you use a triangle? Do you think it's strong? And they were like, stronger. What do, you, what do you mean by that? And then so I was able to pull, and like I said, those visuals. So that's where I'm wanting to get. The ELL side of this, those kids have to have visuals. If I just sit up here and I just talk, and that's all I do to them, they're going to be like, oh, we're at the beginning. Just sitting there with your piece of paper, like, I have no idea what you're saying, I'm not engaged, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and so I pulled those resources and I asked them, I was like, if you take something and you were to put pressure on those shapes, which one do you think would be stronger and why? And it was really impressive to see, even some of my kiddos that don't speak English at all, they were like, like they're, they're like using their hands and like kind of showing um, what would happen. So having that visual kind of, uh, like they, they were kind of thinking it through and they weren't necessarily wanting to talk out loud about it, but they were thinking. Like, and so that was um, getting them engaged. And then we kind of discussed like, well, you see these rectangles, but maybe they turn them into triangles to like make them be more supportive. And it was just really, really good conversation for those kiddos that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not been able to pull some of those um, visuals and resources from that site. So like I said, did not do this entire lesson. None of the things that I have tried so far have I done every single thing. I don't know if I ever will necessarily, but I do like having the opportunity to pull from so many different things to take just a normal lesson up to getting them really up to that higher order of thinking, regardless of the language. Having that visual was a huge thing um, for my kiddos. So then they actually tested out their bridges and it was really impressive 
um, to see to me because I thought, well, they'll have, they'll have fun with it at least. No, they blew me out of water with what they were able to do with these things. And not just that, but the way they were able to work together on this was really impressive. And with the ELLs, you think they have a language barrier, right? We've talked about that. Well, that also includes a lot of times they don't want to talk to the group members too. A lot of times they want to kind of sit back and, and a lot of times they're like, well, I'm afraid of saying something and I'm afraid of being wrong. Um, and what really made me so happy to see in this group right here, this kiddo speaks very fluent English. He's, he can, he's very bilingual and he can fluently switch back and forth. And this kiddo right here, he has gotten so much better since I had him as a sophomore, but he still struggles a little bit. And he really struggles and he, he can come up with the words, but he has a hard time putting them all together a lot of the time and expressing his thoughts. Well, what really made me so happy was to see when I said, okay, so what ideas are y'all thinking of? And so the two kids on the outside, they started talking about what they thought. And then this one was just kind of sitting there. I think he was like, kind of like, I'm not really sure um, what I'm supposed to be saying. And then this kiddo pointed to him and he said, well, he's the leader of our group now. So he's calling the shots. And he was like, he said, what? Like, and he said, yeah, he's calling the shots. So which do you think would be better and why? And he turned and he did that to the, to the kid. And I was like, what is, what, is, what is happening? But I don't know if that would have necessarily happened had it just been like a basic worksheet, you know, plug and chug um, situation. So kind of giving that opportunity for them to communicate and work through that was, was really, really nice. And then after all of that, not only was the actual work they put in really impressive, but the product was like, I was amazed. Um, only one of the bridges broke and I had a hundred pounds. I had a hundred pounds that I put on these bridges and only one of them broke. And I, I ran out of weight. I said, guys, I don't have, I don't have any more weight to, to put on these things. And they were like, well, have somebody stand on it. And I was like, okay, I'm not doing that. But, but it was just really amazing what these kids can do if you put them in the opportunity and you say, this is the expectation you are going to, um, you, you are going to do good things, and I expect that out of you. Okay, um, and then data. So data has been like kind of preached to us a lot throughout this endeavor thing. As far as the big thing about STEM is looking at real world data and kind of seeing, um, making connections um, with that. And I was a little overwhelmed at first whenever I thought, I'm going to try this with my ELO group. I don't really know how that's going to work out. I don't know if I'm going to have a successful time at kind of getting what I want out of this. So what I did was we were teaching the parent functions unit. And so parent functions, um, if you are math, you understand like parent functions, it's like an exponential always looks a certain way. A quadratic always looks a certain way on its graph. So there's all these parent functions. And rather than having my kids memorize these, because they don't do a very good job at like just memorizing stuff that no kids do, to be honest. They have a hard time as far as memorizing and just remembering. So I was like, well, I want to try to have some models to demonstrate this so they can actually remember. And so what I had them do was I had us pretend that we were um, doctors and that we had a patient that could not stand up, and but we still needed their height. So how could we do it? And I had them go and they measured the bone that's called the ulna, and they measured that, and then they measured the height of people. And they did this to our actual staff. Like they went around to our staff members and took data on them. And that right there, they actually had meaning behind the data. And I was like, then it made sense to me that I was like, when those ELO kiddos actually get to see, like that's what this dot actually stands for. Um, it meant so much more to them. So they took the data and then we went back and we plotted it. And right away, after we started plotting it, I said, do you guys kind of notice a pattern or a trend with this? And they said, hey, this looks like that linear one, that linear thing that we were doing. And I said, it does. It looks like a linear graph. And after that, they were able to kind of use it. And they were saying, well, I bet if this person had this size only, they would be so and so feet tall. And they started making those predictions on their own. And then after that, what was really nice to kind of expand that, see, I wouldn't have necessarily been able to do this as easily had I not had some of these NASA resources. So the NASA resource that I pulled was I went through and I looked at all these different data sets and I pulled some of them. And this one has to do with some of the coronavirus data, but I pulled, this was one of them. And I had my kids, I said, okay, now let's look at a different example. 
Um, could this be modeled by something? And they're like, oh yeah, that's that's exponential. And we pulled up a couple more. We looked at one that was quadratic, and they were able to name them all off. And they were like, oh yeah, this looks like this. This looks like this. And they started seeing more meaning behind it rather than just like, oh, this is this like picture I have to memorize. They actually like were seeing, oh, a real world situation. A lot of times can be modeled by these um, graphs. They're not just these pictures that um, we're having them memorize. So it was it was really helpful for them, and it, in a way, when you have that data, that's another visual, right? Like it's another visual for them to kind of see um, and be led through. Okay, and then the last little thing I'm going to do before I let you guys um, kind of explore that stuff is I'm going to look at this main main idea as far as if you're going to have good STEM um, instruction implementation, no matter who it is, what group it is. This is super important, but especially for ELLs. So it says encourage mathematical communication. This is important for all students, but especially for ELLs. And consider the following standard for mathematical practice. Facilitate discourse among students to build shared understanding of mathematical ideas by analyzing and comparing student approaches and arguments. Okay, so that's one of our standards for mathematical practice. And if that does not sum up what we need to be teaching ELL learners you know, across the board, maybe not necessarily maybe great mathematical and everything, but in English, everything, but teaching them how to use language to compare their approaches, argue for something, um, to kind of encourage that. And I will say one way that you can do that is with those ELO kiddos, even if they don't feel comfortable necessarily yet saying it in English, find a way for them to tell somebody in Spanish and then have them translate it. Hopefully there's somebody in your room that can possibly translate. Have them put it on the voice recording. Have them do something where they are still, they're having to talk about what they did um, and encourage that. Um, during the bridge um, project that I did, I literally got blown away by the fact that the students were using that um, vocabulary and mathematical conversation in a way I didn't expect to happen. Um, so the formula that I used on that bridge um, a project to kind of give the kids their score, it incorporated a lot of variables. Like I told them, I said it's going to incorporate, um, it's going to incorporate the weight of the bridge, how heavy your bridge is, how much it was able to hold, the creativity, like was it certain dimensions. There was a lot of stuff they had to kind of make sure they um, included in their bridge, but um, they came up to me and they said, okay, so um, if we're willing to sacrifice some of our weight, maybe we can have a better score on this. And they were kind of manipulating that equation on their own. And they even came up to me and said, um, did so-and-so do better than me because the ratio was better of their um, weight to the load that they were able to hold? And I was like, I was literally like about to be floored because I was like, I had never said that. They they came up with the idea of the ratio was between that. So that was a really, really big deal um, for them and for me. Um, because you'll be kind of amazed at what these kids will do on their own if you just set up the opportunity for them. Because both of those um, ideas I just showed led to them talking about stuff I never expected them to talk about. Like that wasn't necessarily the intention. And it still took off and did way more than I ever, um, ever expected so um, with that being said, um, like I said, these resources came from um, the engineering and I've done many more like I've used um, several things from this, but the teaching engineering, I, I will kind of just show you a glance of it, what it looks like. But if you go to the home screen and I'll give you a second to do this. Um, and if you have the Google slide version of this already, you can go ahead and do it. But um, you, from the home screen, you can literally browse tons of stuff. Now, like I said, this can kind of be overwhelming at first because there's so much stuff. But what I like about this is you can go in and you can click like I only want an activity or maybe I want a lesson or a whole unit. And then you can go in and you can specifically search for what you want. Don't feel like you have to do everything at once, whether you have a bunch of ELL kids or not. For yourself and for your sanity as a teacher, start simple. Like simple can still be rigorous. Like you can start something simple and it can lead to way higher order thinking um, than what you might be thinking. So um, click on any of them. You can go in and you can kind of explore those. 
And this is not just this site. There's there's a bunch. Um, the data that I got a lot of the time is from the um, uh, the NASA data link that's on here. And it's just kind of good to give visuals as well. So what I'm going to have you do to kind of finish up before I have you guys fill out that survey is I want you guys to go through these resources and find at least one thing that you think you could implement into your classroom. Find one thing, does not have to be a whole unit, but one small thing that you think could really up the rigor for your class. While also, if you have ELL learners, try to think of something that will help them, like something that you can also use that will still support them and keep them engaged as well. And when you do that, make sure that you put the thing you found, and you can find several things, but tell me one thing that you found on this slide of our Pear Deck. And then we will end with questions, but take about five minutes to kind of explore, um, explore those resources real quick. 